right, welcome to Roots of Reality Experiences. Today, I'm joined by Lara Citrakian, who is a journalist and president of the Applied Policy Research Institute in Yerevan, Armenia. Additionally, Lara is also the founder and CEO of News Deeply, in the past was a Middle East correspondent for Bloomberg TV and ABC. So, Lara, thanks for coming on today. Thanks for having me. So, uh, when did you first get interested in journalism and covering foreign affairs? Great question. I think um, oh, it's hard to say. I traveled to the Middle East a lot when I was a kid, and I would see bullet holes in walls of different buildings. And I was really mesmerized because there's something kinetic even about the the hole and the bullet hole that's left behind. It's so dramatic. And I would think, who shot that? Who were they aiming at? What happened there? So, and nobody, you know, in my family would talk about it. So it was just this lingering curiosity. And then when I was 17, a TV producer from CBS News came to speak at my school and talked about covering the Balkan War. And when he described the, the delicateness with which he tried to convey what was going on and what he saw on the ground, it really captured my spirit. And after that, I knew that was my way. I tried doing other jobs, partly because my parents were <laughs> encouraging me to do other things, but it wasn't right. It, it, it wasn't right. Nothing was right until I was back on that path. And then some doors opened for me. I worked my tail off. Uh, and thankfully, I had some great opportunities to to do that kind of work. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So a lot of different, I guess, connections in your life that kind of led yes. you down that path. Um. So when did you start covering the sort of crisis between Armenia and Azerbaijan? It was a bit by accident. I was actually on maternity leave when the pandemic started with my second kid. And at that point, I was just thinking what to do next with News Deeply, with the work that I've done uh, traditionally in covering global issues. And while the pandemic was just beginning to unfold in January 2020, uh, I could sense where it was going. I had covered the Ebola crisis uh, as a journalist. I spoke with people I knew, epidemiologists, uh, on what the size and shape of this seemed to be, and it was clearly going to be a long road. So we decided as a family, you know, we can't outrun this thing, but where, where would we want to spend a global pandemic not knowing what's coming at us? And we decided to try spending it in Armenia. We literally put you know, had notebook, notebook paper and wrote down, should we go to New York? Should we go to Dubai? Should we go to, go to Yerevan? And, uh, and we wanted to come here. We thought it would be an interesting place to homeschool our kids and to teach them the Armenian language. My husband and I both happen to be um, Ar Ar Armenian, me from New York and him from Canada, from Montreal, yeah, Canada. Okay. So that I, you know, would be kind of neat to get this cultural experience under our belt and, 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 enjoy it all uh, somehow, even if it was going to be a uh, sort of long quarantine. Sure. And then while we were here during the pandemic, it, uh, the autumn 2020 war broke out between Armenia and Azerbaijan. It certainly wasn't expect something we expected, although looking back, you could sense geopolitically that something was in the air. Uh, I wrote for the New York Times. I wrote for foreign policy about that conflict. Uh, I sort of put on my old journalistic crisis coverage hat and wrote about what was going on. I'd never covered a conflict that involved Armenia and Azerbaijan. And I was very careful as someone who's grown up in an Armenian community environment to make sure that everything I reported was double, triple, quadruple checked, annotated, fact, you know, sourced and footnoted out uh, just to be sure that I wasn't overexposed to one side of the story only. Right. I mean, it's inevitable, right? When you grow up in a community, you hear the community's story. But uh, I reached out to Azeris wherever I could, Azerbaijanis, to hear what their thoughts and feelings were about what was happening. And, you know, I just did my utmost. And then at the end of that war, I was asked to launch a think tank here in Yerevan, which I have been building now with a wonderful group of people for our more than two years. And now wow. we do this combination of geopolitical analysis, convening, peace building, uh, sustainable development, civic engagement, 
Uh, it's a think tank that I've grown to love dearly. It's called the Applied Policy Research Institute of Armenia, APRI Armenia. And, um, you know, like many countries, it, it is a great, great thing to have such institutes, independent, nonpartisan, uh, we call it policy accelerator, to try to encourage a more accelerated trajectory for good things to bloom in this region, in this country. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Okay. Um, now, can you describe sort of the, the origins of this conflict, as well as like what's happening currently? Because I'm sure for a lot of people, you know, this is uh, pretty foreign. Um, I don't think too many Americans are aware of it, though. It's, I know it's been getting more exposure kind of as of late. Yep. It's always a big question where you start the story. But to be fair, I think it is pretty pretty consistent to start with the the Soviet Union, the early days of the Soviet Union. So back then, as many people know, Armenians had gone through a pretty devastating genocide in 1915. The Ottoman Empire wiped out two thirds of the Armenian population, about one and a half million people, including members of my family. And so the surviving Armenians from that scattered throughout the Middle East and, and started a small republic of their own on part of what is now Armenia, a little bit larger. Um, in those days, it was, it was you know, really they call, in the, the mythology among Armenians, sort of barefoot and hungry <laughs> Armenians trying to build a country of their own. Um, and uh, it, it eventually fell to the Soviet Union, became part of the Soviet Union, in part because they didn't feel they could protect themselves from any future onslaught from Turkey to come finish them off. So very insecure, but very sort of emotionally um, fervent Armenians sort of betting on Russia at the time to be a better source of security and stability than trying to go it alone and protect themselves, what was left of them from Turkey. So once that, you know, as this, this Soviet empire uh, dis- sort of apportioned the boundaries of different Soviet republics and essentially came up with a management model for the Soviet republics. One of the strategies that was devised in the 1920 is that republics like the Armenian SSR, or the Azerbaijani SSR, Soviet Socialist Republic, um, should in, in fact contain a little poison pill as, much, as often as possible essentially giving a chunk of an ethnically Armenian territory to Azerbaijan or in other country, republics, other, other mixes. It just purposely putting these small enclaves of a different ethnicity into one of the Soviet republics to destabilize it slightly, to integrate the two, to make them perhaps codependent, less likely to fight each other, but above all, so that if things ever got out of hand, or if Moscow at the time, the Soviet uh, seat of power, had trouble managing or reining in the ambitions of any one country, they had leverage in the form of a different ethnic group in that republic that could be played up, played against the central leadership. This is uh, this has created problems throughout the former Soviet republics, not only Nagorno-Karabakh. It it was designed to create problems. And in fact, it has succeeded in creating problems 100 years later. So this small ethnic Armenian enclave, Nagorno-Karabakh, was essentially land granted to, to the Azeri so- Socialist Republic. And over the course of the Soviet period, the Armenians of that region kept asking to get reassigned to Soviet Armenia, basically saying, put us back where we belong. Uh, and they were granted a high degree of autonomy, very unusual for that time. They had a lot of cultural rights. They could perform, sing, read, teach in their own language. It was, it was a strange setup, but it worked. So they had this sort of autonomous, they called it an oblast, a little island of Armenians running their society for the most part within Soviet Azerbaijan. Fast forward to the 1980s. The Soviet Union is relaxing some of its restrictions, at least purportedly glasnost, perestroika, the easing of some of those traditional strictures. And in that climate, the Armenians of Azerbaijan began asking, uh, that area of Azerbaijan, the the Nagorno-Karabakh enclave, start asking uh, authorities in the Soviet Union to 
either grant them independence or reassign them to Armenia. Really, they petition, they, they stick their necks out. They write petitions, they start organizing referenda. Uh, and this very, very greatly displeases the Azeri authorities in Baku. So that starts to create the tension there of, okay, this is, they're getting a little uppity. They want more than they have. And, and, and it's really not a, a pleasant thing for Azerbaijan. The Aliyev family by then is already running essentially Azerbaijan. So the, pre- the father of the current president, Haider Aliyev, rose to power around 1969 in the Soviet. And it was pretty powerful before then. But from there on, he is this really very powerful man. He makes it his personal mission to reign in the Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh. So it becomes really this, this interlocking set of problems and people, frankly, that remain pretty consistent over time. As the Soviet Union begins to show cracks and collapse, the Armenians and the Azerbaijanis really start to see a lot of kinetic uh, action. Pogroms in Baku, a lot of deaths of many, many Armenians, uh, retaliation from Armenians against Azerbaijanis, very, um, very, very difficult, very, very tense and very deadly conditions. Uh, at that time, the you start to see an outflow of Armenians from Azerbaijan to Armenia or, or out further out to the west or to Moscow. It just no longer feels safe for Armenians and Azerbaijanis to live side by side anymore. The, it starts to get very, very poisonous. And the Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh very overtly demand their independence. So in the last days of the Soviet Union, before it officially collapses, they hold a referendum declaring their independence from Azerbaijan, from the Soviet Union, all, all across of the Azeri authorities de- declare it illegal and invalid, but essentially the uh, Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh go on to declare their independence and start building a self-declared republic of their own. This sparks all-out war between Azerbaijan and Armenia for two years, 1992 to 1994. And that is an extremely bloody, extremely brutal, difficult war. Eventually the Armenians of the region prevail. And they go on for the next 30 years, more or less, roughly until 2020, to build an independent, uh, democratic society, like a little island in the middle of Azerbaijan. They have their own parliament, their own universities, free press. Uh, Azerbaijan does not have those things. It's a different kind of system. It's a rather closed political environment. Again, the Aliyev family has been in power now for decades. So they, they've created a certain kind of structure you can read the Freedom House report about Azerbaijan. It will explain everything from that perspective. But these Armenians sort of build their own society. It does quite well. The per capita income, I think, was at the time of the 2020 war as high or higher than the average citizen of Azerbaijan. They they make it work for themselves, more or less. It's not perfect, but, but they make it work. Uh, Azerbaijan, for many, many years vows that it will reassert control, it will reintegrate this this little island into Azerbaijan proper, that the Azeris who were forced to leave those lands should be given will be given the chance to return back. Even though the Armenians were the majority in Nagorno-Karabakh, they were not there's no part of this region where it's exclusively one ethnic group. It never was historically. You always the, the land that is Armenia now contained Turks, Persians, so on and so right. forth. The land that is Azerbaijan contained Armenians. Turkey is where my ancestors are from. So all of this, you know, all or nothingism in terms of who lives there is a fiction and a dangerous one. But it is where we are as a human civilization. So essentially, Azerbaijan vows to take back Nagorno-Karabakh. In 2020, they use a very superior arsenal of weapons, superior oil and gas wealth, and frankly, a lot of smart strategy, 21st century warfare, to go in and reassert control over Nagorno-Karabakh. And they retake a third of the territory. About 5,000 people die on the Armenian side, which is a lot in any country, but certainly quite a lot in a country as small as Armenia. And that sets the stage for this mess that we're in now. Uh, A ceasefire was brokered by Russia. It was the Uh, the Trump administration's decision to pull back diplomatically what had traditionally been a very active U.S. foreign policy in this region. So used to have a balance between the U.S. and Russia and France often as well 
helping out in the diplomatic solutions and peace building tracks. But in 2020, it was all left all in Russia's hands. So it became really a Russia centric ceasefire. Russian peacekeepers were sent to watch over Nagorno Karabakh to police the, the, the ceasefire deal. Uh, and Azerbaijan and Armenia were expected to essentially respect uh, the, the line of contact and the all sorts of conditions that were set at the end of the war in November 2020. Now, with the Ukraine war bringing Russia down several notches in terms of its bandwidth, its hardware, its power, its hard power, its soft power, um, what we've seen is it's no longer able to police the two parties and keep Armenia and Azerbaijan in check. And again, Azerbaijan with superior military force, with superior uh, oil and gas wealth, is using its superior leverage to press Armenia and the Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh into essentially ending the story of Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh. And what's happened since December 12, specifically, is that the one road into Nagorno-Karabakh, so the one road that connects 120,000 people to the outside world, has been blocked by a mix of Azeri protesters who are aligned with the government and uh, Azeri military forces patrolling the road. So in Azerbaijan, you cannot have a civic protest without permission of the government. It's not legal and it's not advisable. Um, it's very dangerous, in fact. There's very little room for that sort of civic demonstration. So when these protests shut down the road and essentially blockaded the population, uh, it was very clearly a policy, government policy, and th that it's gone on for now nearly two months um, is an extreme assault on the people who live there. It's basically a message that we're going to make your life unlivable until you leave. So Armenians say this is, we're on the brink of ethnic cleansing. This is essentially genocide. Genocide is, as you know, partly defined, is a forced uh, exodus. It's a coercion of a certain group to leave a certain place. Basically, Azerbaijan seems intent on taking the land without the Armenians in it. And this seems to be a major salvo in, in the conflict between Armenians and Azerbaijan toward that end. And that's what people are afraid of now. There's 120,000 people suffering many deprivations. Gas and electricity are being cut. Normal inflow of food and medicine and vital supplies has slowed to a trickle. The Red Cross can bring in some supplies, but certainly not enough to sustain the population. And um, if this is how the story of Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh ends after hundreds and hundreds of years of their presence, it will say something very dark and very dramatic about what conflict means in, in 2023 and beyond. Yeah. It's a, yeah. 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 That's um yeah thanks for the you know, really good explanation of all those different factors um and really breaking it down so I think the average person will be able to sort of digest that pretty well um I guess a additional complexity of that is you know the international community trying to figure out you know what to do now uh, with that situation and I guess especially since the international community is you know I the impression I get is pretty sympathetic to you know these Armenians that are trapped there um. You know, trying to get access to the outside world while at the same time recognizing Azerbaijan as internationally, you know, controlling that territory, technically, even if they don't actually control it. Um, and so trying to balance those complexities in the world, you know, uh, what do you think the international community can do to try to fix this situation, especially with Russia, you know, not very focused on this right now? Yeah. This dilemma you described was always the heart of the matter. How essentially do you fix what Stalin broke or solve the problem that the Soviet Union planted on purpose um, in this specific arrangement, right? So there are a lot of formulas that were floated. Okay, so Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh have talked about wanting independence. Okay, that's a little tricky uh, to say the least. The international community has always said both things, that Azerbaijan has the right to its territorial sovereignty, but also that the people of Nagorno-Karabakh have the right to self-determination. There's not yet been a magic formula for how those two things resolve and exist side by side. Um, and frankly, it may be because of that and the superior force of one side now that it's simply trying to resolve for one thing, which is the territorial control 
the control over the resources in that area uh, and the people can essentially leave if they don't like it. So there are, even if they were to say, okay, Armenians will stay, Azerbaijan will have its sovereignty, but there will also be special rights and protections. There will be all sorts of international mechanisms to make sure that the people, the Armenians living there are not slaughtered, that they are granted their ability to speak their language and sing in their language or pray in their language, their churches, you know, very, very ancient churches will remain in their ecclesiastical, you know, practice and, and, and not taken away or which all of which has happened, which is why people are worried about it happening again. Uh, who would guarantee that for how long? It's very tricky. Uh, and so it's, there is no good answer for that. What the international community has affirmed, and this is everyone from the Pope in the Vatican to Secretary of State Antony Blinken has called for that road to be reopened, blockading sure. and collectively sure. punishing 120,000 people because you don't like the political situation is unacceptable. It's illegal. It's cruel. And it certainly doesn't build confidence that these people can live peacefully as citizens of Azerbaijan. Yeah. Uh, so it was, frankly, the ultimate torpedo to the hopes for coexistence. Uh, so how do, where do we take it? There's always a solution. If now, Aliyev has been very cruel in his statements, very, very dark, um, especially when it's talking to or about Armenians. Uh, a lot of direct messages, including the way out is open. You can it's even offer you know, to pay the taxi for people who want to leave Nagorno-Karabakh, for Armenians who want to leave. So they made it very clear, you know, they're going to make living conditions there very rough, but you're free to go if you'd like. And we have not seen a mass exodus of people. So there's a will for people to stay. A lot of those who would have gone have probably left sometime in the past 10 to 15 years. Yeah. And so let's see, you never know how things might resolve. You never know what deal could be struck. But re protecting the rights of people who feel threatened, who feel, you know, they can point to many instances in the past three to four years, whether it's the beheading of uh, Armenians by their captor, Azeri, Azeri captors, the, the, the uh, execution of POWs, the mutilation of women, uh, Armenian women captured on video, released on social media by Azerbaijani soldiers. There are many, many very fair reasons why the Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh are afraid of what's ahead if they're reintegrated into Azerbaijan. There's an infamous case of uh, an Azeri and an Armenian who were in a training session, a NATO training session together in Hungary and the Azeri ax murdered the Armenian in, in his sleep and was returned to Azerbaijan as a hero and celebrated upon his arrival. These things do not help the Armenians of Azerbaijan feel comfortable no. uh, and safe. So how do you build those confidence measures? Well, the international community can and should put pressure on President Aliyev to tone down the rhetoric, to create the conditions and the atmosphere for people to trust one another and to do what's necessary. I mean, they have the upper hand. Let them use it to draw a more peaceful picture of coexistence between these two people. Yeah, I mean, it seems like in this particular situation also that, I mean, the U.S. and the European Union would have a fair amount of influence given... Uh, you know, the amount of foreign aid they can they send to Azerbaijan um, and Armenia and the economic ties. Uh, so, you know, what would you say to to people who are, you know, unsure about whether you know the U.S. or the European Union, for example, should get involved? Uh, obviously, there's, you know, many people uh, that are kind of afraid of foreign conflicts today and, you know, are even skeptical of, of what's going on with Ukraine and Russia and, and the involvement of the U.S. and the European Union. So how do you, uh, you know, encourage people like this is something that matters and it can have domino yeah. effects? It's not anymore a small local or regional spat. It has become an issue that has major U.S. interests at stake. And that includes, frankly, not setting an example for future conflicts where you can choke off over a hundred thousand people as a negotiating tactic yeah which is a very dangerous precedent and frankly partly because the u.s has stood up and called it out from the very beginning if this results in ethnic cleansing and if that succeeds as a negotiating tactic as a political tactic 
it will have happened under the watchful eye of Western powers. It just undermines tremendously the moral credibility of the U.S. and the and the EU, frankly. Now, the sad thing about ethnic cleansing is the evidence of it happens when it's already complete. So this is an opportunity to step in before lives are lost and before there's another tragic circumstance you look back on 10 years from now and say, say isn't it a shame we didn't do something? Even with all that, I think the most important thing about this situation is that the U.S. has tremendous diplomatic leverage to make a difference and to stabilize this region. And it wants stability in this region for many reasons. You know, it is good for America to avoid another major conflict in this part of the world. And this is still amazingly an, an issue and a conflict where the U.S. can deconflict the two sides with a series of phone calls. I was speaking with diplomats today who were describing to me often, you know, in great detail, uh, you know, it has been the case in the past six to eight months that the U.S. phones the region and is able to essentially apply diplomatic pressure that keeps the conflict from escalating into more dangerous and deadly levels of interaction. So this is tremendous. You know, America is fighting in Ukraine in, or is helping Ukraine fight and to reverse that is part of the fight in Ukraine in part to prove that it can support a small democratic country against a large autocratic neighbor, that it has influence and can produce worthwhile outcomes in the former Soviet Union. And that is the very same equation that's at stake here. But the costs are lower. It is purely a matter of using the diplomatic leverage that it has on Turkey and Azerbaijan, who often act in concert when it comes to the Armenian issue, to simply ratchet down what has been a very destabilizing set of policies. No one is saying to Azerbaijan not to request X, Y, or Z in Karabakh. No one is saying that they shouldn't be wealthy and or even you know wonderfully successful as a country it is simply do not break these norms do not uh do not impose acts of cruelty violence or aggression against your armenian neighbor just sit tight and be a good global citizen in the context of this war and you know both sides have sins to account for but they're just not going to clear up when this sort of climate is is at play. Yeah. Well, I mean, it seems like the last few years especially has been kind of a, a whirlwind for geopolitical issues, um, you know, and Armenia, like Ukraine, is this up-and-coming democracy that's made significant reforms as of late, um, yet there are these, you know, authoritarian nations around the world that seem to be becoming more aggressive um, with their you know, political agendas, uh, often which involves some type of military force. So, you know, what lessons can democracies around the world learn from the behavior of dictatorships lately and the challenges of dealing with them? Obviously, you know, uh, China and Taiwan is another potential conflict that people are concerned about. So what, what's your take on that? It's not pretty. And it's not going to be cheery. But I think one of the biggest lessons is that dictatorships and autocracies have a huge strategic advantage in the current climate. Above all, because they last a lot longer, they have a longevity and they've had time to plan and stock up and they don't have, I'm not saying I would want to be a dictatorship or live in a sure, dictatorship, sure. but when it comes to these moments of conflict, they impose information blockades, they uh, make they suffer their population. They have no accountability to their own populations. Their populations can suffer a lot before they really uh, are at risk of, of losing their prominent position over a political system. So, and, and again, I think, you know, when you look at what Armenia is trying to do at this point is survive. And Azerbaijan is, is a former ambassador, former U.S. ambassador to Armenia told me yesterday what they gained in 2020 opened up their appetite. It wet their, wet their appetite for more territorial gains. And that is what the West needs to stand up and check. Okay, you know, you can't simply talk about taking over the bottom half of Armenia or cutting across and establishing your own road through Armenia. These are the things that Azerbaijan is 
is saying it wants and is actually specifically saying that if Armenia doesn't give them, that they will take them by force, verbatim, you know, yeah. language. So when those plans have clearly been baked over decades, the stockpiling, the strategy, that's, I mean, it's, it's great to have a lot. Everyone extols the benefits of long-term planning. Dictatorships get to do more long-term planning because the same people are in the se- same seats for a longer period of time. And that's not, again, something I would wish as an American, but I'm noticing that it makes a very big difference in terms of their ability to hold on in these very dramatic confrontations. So we'll see how it plays out with others. But, you know, while even if Russia is weakened by what's happening in Ukraine, it can stand a lot. It can bear a lot. If you look at President Bashar al-Assad in Syria, he has withstood a lot. These systems are somehow very resilient. Unless you have a situation like Muammar Gaddafi in Libya or Saddam Hussein, where it's just a manhunt, essentially. These systems are perversely resilient and, and often are holding their own against the West and against democratic systems, no matter how much we prefer democratic systems. You know, how many Western leaders called for the resignation of Charles Assad? in the past 15 years and you know, it just hasn't happened. Yeah. It's um, it's pretty disturbing. And it just shows how much, uh, you know, the West needs to continue to be thinking all the time about dictatorships. As long as dictatorships exist, there's going to be the concern that, you know, some dictator is going to decide, all right, I'm going to go and try to take this territory that I think belongs to me, or I'm going to claim at least belongs to me. And Absolutely, that's just a reoccurring theme. It never ends. And as soon as you sleep on it, then you embolden them to do something. And then they, you know, if they're successful, will continue to do more and more and more. Yes. Um, as history and what has I've shown. noticed is that these countries tend to be run by people who are used to getting their way. Yeah. So it's it's really if we're going to live in a rules based global order, there has to be a commitment to some sort of deterrence to that kind of behavior otherwise every powerful country is going to take what it wants from every less powerful country yeah and that's a dangerous uh precedent as well absolutely well um laura what are you currently working on just shifting gears a little bit so much uh mostly well our three pillars at the think tank at apri armenia which are regional stability sustainable development so we call stable prosperity and civic engagement so all kinds of um you know sometimes i worked for mckinsey very briefly in my life we they call it like free mckinsey for a country yeah policy recommendations turn around how to build a better place um and you know having covered those sorts of issues for so many years to actually get to work on them from a policy perspective and a research perspective um, and dialogue building and track to diplomacy. It's very, very enriching. So I guess just trying to move the world ever so slightly in the direction we want to see. Yeah. That's cool. All the work you're doing and you know, all the knowledge that you continue to collect over time from all those experiences. That's super awesome. And uh, what's the best way for people to keep track of your work? I assume Twitter is one of them. Yeah, Twitter is always good. I haven't I haven't been super active, but I'm going to be more active. I'm at Lara, L-A-R-A. Perfect. I was early. <laughs> I got Lara. <laughs> That's right. You have to be if you're able to get that. Yeah, it's no, no. Perfect. I'm well, blessed. thank you so much for uh, Thanks, taking ben. the time and to you know talk about everything and, and break that down for people. Of course. Um, really appreciate it. Great to join you. Have awesome. a great day out there.